Hello folks, I want to introduce you to a very awesome guest. Uh, she's one of my favorite tech entrepreneurs in Charlotte. Maggie Williams is the CEO and founder of dog walking venture Skipper, formerly Waggle. Uh, my consulting company Level built the first version of her product and myself and my team were just very impressed with, with Maggie and her team from day one. Um, and in full disclosure, I have invested in Skipper's last round of funding, so very interested in their success for a number of reasons. Um, I'll let Maggie introduce the company here shortly, but keep in mind uh, they closed a round of funding. They're in the process of closing and have started closing on the second round, as I mentioned, uh, attended Techstars, and they're growing very quickly. Um, I'm personally fascinated by women in tech and early stage companies as I feel we don't have enough of either. Uh, but I'm even more fascinated by this story because Maggie started the company with her wonderful husband, Sebastian. Mm -hmm. So sure, we're gonna talk a lot about that. Uh, Maggie, please give an introduction to Skipper and, and your progress to date, if you would. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I'm really excited to talk with you. I'm glad to know you. Um, my name is Maggie Williams. I am the founder and CEO of Skipper. We are trusted care for busy people who love their pets. We started um, as a tech-driven dog walking company. Um, we would like to say that we are a logistic service that sells trust. Um, we have built our own proprietary technology that drives um, a real-time experience for our users that includes real-time updates, GPS tracking, um, pet photos, and really is able to deliver a quality service at scale. We have recently um, started to partner in a bigger way with multifamily apartment communities to really change the game when it comes to pet care amenities that are offered to apartment residents. And we're really looking forward, kind of in this new chapter, to um, really own the pet parent experience and what that means. Excellent, excellent. Well, I, I, um, I, I call when we were working on, on your, the first version of your app and the name was Waggle, and I recall seeing the, the lock boxes at different different houses and communities. So you seem to have done a very good job in in Charlotte. You're open in a couple of other markets, is that correct? Yeah, we uh, we launched in Austin, Texas, uh, middle of last year, and then at the end of last year, we launched in Dallas. So in three markets total right now. Wow, any better traction in one than the other? Obviously, where you start, you you probably got the most traction, but yeah, mostly because of learnings. Gotcha. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean they're taking off. Dallas is you know four times bigger, so so we expected to to see higher growth there, and 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 that has been the case. Um, now but, is that mostly in the city, or do you? Because Plano is obviously mm -hmm. a, a big market there, and Frisco. Are you seeing some of the suburban markets as well, or is it just across the board? We are focused on on, on density, so mm -hmm. we kind of target the zip codes that have um, that have a higher population density, and so we're kind of inner city to Dallas and Austin as well. Um, it's one of the things that we learned when we launched in Charlotte. The many things that we learned um, is that at scale, you know, density becomes a really critical factor for us to be able to kind of achieve achieve the margins we're looking for. Um, which is why apartment communities and, and partnering there make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so because of that, we've really focused our area on um, high, den high density, high population, um, millennial focused zip codes. Excellent, that makes a lot of sense. Now, you came from a big consulting company prior to starting this, is that correct? Yeah, I used to work for IBM um, out of New York. I worked for their global business services practice. Um, I used to do large scale technical transformations for Fortune mm -hmm. 500 companies, which is a fancy way of saying that <laughs> big companies have outdated tech that's super siloed and we would come in and help them fix it. Excellent. Oh um, yeah. Excellent, how long were you there? Three years. Three years, wow, that's great. What, what a great experience to have. Um, when did you know that you were ready to pursue Skipper? Because obviously GBS is a prestigious job and, and a sought after job with a great career path and lots of money and perks and everything else. What, what, what kind of triggered the jump there? Or how did that come about? Yeah, so there are a couple inflection points um, between IBM and, and Skipper. Um, my husband and I, we met in college and um, after we got married, while we were both actually working for IBM, we decided to take nine months off and backpack mm -hmm. around the world. Traveling has always been a passion. How millennial? Of ours. How millennial? <laughs> <laughs> yep, we wanted to find ourselves. <laughs> That's great. I wish I had done yeah. that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we so we did that big backtracking trip, and then we came back to Charlotte, 
and we knew that we wanted to have impact. We, we've always had the kind of entrepreneur itch. So um, we both started working in two different startups mm -hmm. um, in Charlotte. And um, I worked for a company, a VC-backed company called Moveloot, that was an online marketplace where you could buy and sell used and new furniture. They raised $20 million and wow. um, ended up going bankrupt within four years. Wow. And what year was this? This was in 2015. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and so why did I start I start <laughs> Skipper? Well, because <laughs> our, my other company went under, um, and I had a personal pain point with that. We had two dogs. Okay. And could what not kind of dogs? Find two golden doodles. Oh. Yeah, they're the best. <laughs> they are. They really are. Do you have dogs? Two chocolate labs. Nice. Yeah. They would get along, but yeah. don't know any. Very high energy. Very high energy. I've never met a stranger. Yep. Um, yeah, and we, you know, we had both my husband and I had really busy work lives and and social lives, and um, found it really hard to find an accountable service that we could bring in to help mm -hmm. take care of our pups. And the more that we talked to people, the more research that we did, we realized that there was a real gap in the market. Mm -hmm. um, and this had been on my mind forever, and it was honestly the you know being pushed out of, of my position at MoveLoot um, because of those circumstances was really the impetus to say, you know what, I, I feel like I'm at rock bottom, like mm -hmm. we, should, we should try this. Was Let's there a temptation to go back to the security of an IBM and the paycheck and the stability? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yes and no. I, it felt like it felt like an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So actually, it felt like depression. So like the first couple of weeks of being laid off mm -hmm. um, for someone that had never been laid off before, and what that was not in the realm of my, you know, paradigm to think that that, that would happen. And when it did, it was it was very free. I think everybody should be sure. laid off um, <laughs> in their life at some point. Um, and and kind of had this soul searching moment of like, well, what do I do next? You know, I'm you know, 27 years old, and you know, what kind of impact do I want to make? This is an opportunity to to try something. And worst case scenario is never that bad. You know, like there's, there's sure. and and saying that again and again, and and knowing that this idea had been kind of been in my a, a seed in my brain for a long time, and I felt. I felt that there were a lot of yeah. When it sticks around, oh yeah, you just can't ideas stop come and go, about but it. when it's all you can think oh, about, oh man, you know I would look at it all the time, and I would see these these other providers out there, and I'm like, they're not doing it right. So WAG was around at this point. Yeah, well, WAG was around just barely, but WAG was around, and, and still the marketplace is dominated by more local shops and just neighborhood gotcha. dog walkers, and it's just you're looking at it, like, that's not going to scale. Yeah. Right, and and not only that, but it's 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 the the potential danger that pets are putting in and. And, and pet parents aren't getting the kind of quality and the convenience that, that they deserve, you know, for, to accommodate kind of the modern lifestyle. All of these things just made this something that would not go away. And I was like, I need to, I need to, I need to do it. Like, so, I'll regret it if I don't try. Well, that, that's great. We're glad that you did. So Sebastian, you mentioned, was at a startup. What was the startup that he went to at the time? Sebastian was working um, for a two-person startup called Yodish. Okay. So he was building a mobile app for people with uh, food allergies to help them kind of find and locate food, local food options that mm -hmm. would kind of serve their dietary needs. Okay. So, so you came from a somewhat technical background in that you were leading large technology transformations. Was it, was it pretty hands-on or was it more from a product and project management perspective? So I was more on the process and strategy side. Gotcha. Um, I would not consider myself technical. Mm -hmm. um, I am around tech more than I'm in it. Mm -hmm. um, and have been fortunate for the community that, and network that I've built to, to help support um, how we've gone about bringing our technical team in-house. Um, Level actually was a big part of that. When we, um, when we were transitioning our, our team in-house, when we built mm -hmm. our MVP with you, um, your team was like instrumental in helping me find and locate Luke. Yeah, it was huge. <laughs> um, I don't know where we would be today had your team not been supportive in, in helping us look, you know, identify Luke, who ended up being a game changer for us, right? I mean, he's our he's our sure. technical partner, and um, he's he's built everything since since you handed it off. Excellent. Yeah, it's very hard running a consulting company because our people like working for startups, but a lot of startups are just people with ideas and no passion to execute on it, and they don't really understand what it takes to make to make things happen and. To get to the level where you guys are, we probably see 20 companies before we find one who can get to where you are. And that's the challenge for us as a consulting company is we can also go chase the AIGs and the Bank of Americas and the, and, and the large manufacturers and the large airlines and, and, and chase big projects. With startups, it's small, you know, there's smaller budgets to begin with and many sure. don't work out. And when I heard your story, I remember Asaf telling me about it, and, he, and 
I was always skeptical of every startup. And he's like, John, trust me. <laughs> these, these, these two are going to make it. They're both amazing. They both get it. And now, did Sebastian have a fairly technical hands-on background? If he was in a two-person company making an app, or was he was he more of your kind of background? No, well? he's he was an op, he's ops background. So they um, okay. they ended up outsourcing their their development team. Mm -hmm. um, and so they didn't have any in-house in-house okay. tech. We'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit. One of the things I'm curious about, always curious about, is how much money did you start the company with? Did you go out and get some, and you don't have to give exact dollar amounts, order of magnitude is fine, but was it you two ponied up the, 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 the savings or you know, took out a mortgage on the house or what, you know, how, how did you go about uh, bootstrapping? Yeah, so we, um, so when we bootstrapped, so it was, it was a couple milestones. So we put in, I think $5,000 $5, initially. Mm -hmm. Um, we were profitable right away because you know, I was the dog walker and I, you know, I was the, the whole process. Um, and then as we just as we started to understand, you know, how we were differentiated and, and and the plans to scale, we obviously needed more funding, and we did. And I, I remember that moment where Seb and I were sitting in the kitchen and we we're looking at each other and we're like, so we've got like thirty five, forty thousand dollars of personal savings, like it's kind of locked away for, um, you know. We're talking whatever whatever we were, were planning on doing there. Like, is this is this going to be it? Like, we going to do this? And I, I remember us like looking at each other like, let's do it, right? Yeah. Like, let's let's see what's going to happen. And that was initially what we used to drive um you know, in initial scale, but but working with you, mm -hmm. um because obviously that was a that was a capital investment to to invest in our technology. And then we ended up um applying for an SBA loan through mm -hmm. the bank that was personally leveraged um, on on us, on our house. And I remember that being another conversation wow. of like, well, like, what do we do if we lose our house? You know, <laughs> like, well, I guess we just rent. You know, yeah. like, you know, we just go live with some friends. Like, yeah. you know, we were like playing out the scenarios of- But at least you did it when you were young enough to live yeah. as an option. Well, yeah, right? uh, and, it's, and it's, you know, I recognize the privilege of having options. Sure. Um, but I, yeah, I remember that was like the next conversation of like, okay, like, yeah. <laughs> now we're $150,000, like personally leveraged on us is this, well, I, I like to tell folks when they come to me with their ideas, they, and I hear a lot of ideas, and I tell everybody, every idea is a good idea. There's almost no bad ideas out there. And I ask people, do you believe in this idea no. enough that you will take every dollar that you've got, mortgage your house, and beg and borrow from every member of your family yeah. to make this thing happen? And if you have to hesitate and, and kind of hem and haw over that, that you probably aren't committed enough to the, to the idea. I mean, there are some folks who are successful without that level of commitment, but I do think that that's, oh, yeah. that's a requisite for success um, in, in the startups that, that I've been involved with or, or exposed to. Um, was there a moment, so, so you obviously push all the chips in and probably feeling pretty euphoric. What, what was the first moment where you realized you aren't in Kansas anymore and maybe you've made a bad decision or maybe you, you know, you're, you're re at least rethinking that decision? I remember, so, so the first year we, um, I, I remember that we were scared to scale. Mm -hmm. I was scared to let go, knowing that trust was such an integral component of what we were doing. Hiring our dog walk, the hiring team members was a um, a barrier, a mental barrier I had to get over because I was scared. I, was, sure. I feared the outcome. I knew that I would do a good job, right? Like I yep. had so much trust in myself being able to execute. And a little in Sebastian. Okay. And then, yeah, and, and yeah, a little, yeah, sometimes more <laughs> depending on the day. Um, and I remember we like at at one point we were living a life where we would leave the house separately at six in the morning because our, our services started at seven we'd pack coolers for the day in in our cars that would like sustain us for the like all of our meals for the whole day and we would not we wouldn't get back home until like 10 30 at night mm -hmm. and we did this wow. for like we did this for a couple months um and it just you know i remember looking at him like this isn't gonna work like we we're, we're not doing this right like we need to we need to get out of our heads and like figure out how to how to how to grow this and like take the scary step. Um, you know, I think we had that conversation once like in the parking lot of a McDonald's like on Christmas day, because that was like, we were staying over at different clients' homes and I was like, Seth, like we gotta figure this out. Like this isn't, yeah. th these processes are breaking. Sure. <laughs> um, and so it was it was those moments where, you know, we, we really made the next push to like, let's take this to the next level. And I feel like that dialogue, that internal dialogue has stayed the same. It's like constantly being like, what's not working? And sure. how do we how do we take this to the next level? And fighting through the fear that you, I that, that can that can really hold you down yeah. and hold you back. 
And, and you've probably gotten to a point where now you've got trusted people that you are seeing the same challenges and they need to scale and they need to let go, but it's hard for you to have them let go and it's hard for them to let go. And, Absolutely. And we always found there were just generations of growing pains where yeah. you move somebody into a role that they don't know how to do <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. you, and you backfill them with someone who doesn't know how to do the role that they know how to do yeah. very well. And it's, it's challenging. It's, it's very frightening. It's, it's very frightening. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, coming together around that uncertainty and like and and looking at that as as what's exciting about what we're doing mm -hmm. um i think constantly gets us out of a mindset that would continually like draw back in fear um but no it is it's like we're, we're making a lot of stuff up as we go yeah. right and we learn a lot and we know we're gonna fail but if we're not putting ourselves out there then we're not innovating and we yeah. know that too um, and I think that that's the biggest that's the biggest risk of failure, right? Is to yeah. do nothing. Yeah, that's a tough trade off to, yeah. to to decide on, and it, and as you said, it's a constantly evolving thing that you have to look at constantly. And the answer might change when you're a ten million dollar company versus a twenty versus a thirty. Yeah, you know, very different answers. That's uh, that's definitely a, a challenging part to scaling. And and it sounds like. Most of your support network was the two of you. Did you have any mentors that you could reach out to along the way and say, hey, here's what I'm seeing, here's what I'm thinking? Or Not initially, and I think we found them. Mm -hmm. I found them, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, and I think that's why, you know, the husband and wife team, like, I think it, why it works so well is we had, each, Sebastian and I had each other, right? We were our own thought leaders. And um, I remember, I used to listen to podcasts. Like, that was my attempt at, like, at really finding um, help and, and mentorship was we, I would be on walks like all day sure. I'd walk 15 miles a day I didn't even think about that sometimes right so yeah. I had all this time <laughs> and I just became this like podcast addict um, <laughs> which was great because I learned a lot and then you know it started there and that, that at that time the podcast was my community and then I slowly started to, to become more... By the way, any favorites that you want to share with the audience? Oh, gosh. I love Entra. Um, Entra Leadership was one of my favorite. Okay. Dave Ramsey leads that. Um, How I Built This is great. Um, I, I love the good, you know, Radio Lab, NPR, all of that. Um, it's funny. It's like it's, I have less time to do it now, and, it, and sometimes I nostalgically think back on the days when I would, you know, just be like just like walked every mile of Charlotte. Sure. <laughs> just like that was my job was like <laughs> listening to podcasts. Um, but you know, what I learned from that and then, and then eventually like, you know, having relationships with, within the entrepreneurial community and then built and then finding mentors here, um, really changed the game for me. And it, it's, yep. it's what keeps me going. Right. And I, it's one of the best parts about raising money is bringing in new people, sure. like, you know, having, having institutional knowledge come in, who's vested in your success. Um, like having people like you as, as like thought leaders around me that I can go to when I have like specific asks and challenges. You know, that's just I'm humbled and so grateful to, to have that. And what a what a cool opportunity to be able to build something around people that like can can, you know, really, really make the difference. Sure. And, and I think that's what a lot of people miss about these massive ecosystems um, like, like Silicon Valley is that the, the echo chamber and the support network is so amazing um, because you can you can re hear about it on a podcast that's that's one thing and that's useful and that wasn't available 15 20 years ago so there's certainly value in that you can talk to a lot of gurus in the entrepreneurial community who have never even maybe opened their own lemonade stand but they do know about business and they may know about commercial real estate but where you really get the value is from folks who have been there and done that and seen similar types of challenges and and the more of these success stories that we have within Charlotte, uh, the, the stronger we start to reinforce one another. And I think that's when you're going to start seeing the venture capital and some of the other aspects of a mature ecosystem. But it, it, it starts with the successes. It starts with the Avid exchanges and the passports and the map anything mm -hmm. and the skippers and, you know, and, and, and go on down the list. And that's what's exciting to me is seeing that build over the last 10 years in our, in our local community. Oh, sure. absolutely. Well, when I lived in Austin last year, um, Austin is a product of, of Dell, mm -hmm. right? The Dellionaires that came out of um, uh, Dell's IPO in the 80s, right? I think at one point I read that that, that IPO created 2,700 millionaires, wow. right? And then it all trickled back down into the entrepreneurial community. It's one of the reasons yep. that Austin is such a strong tech startup hub. Absolutely. Um, and we need that here. And like with Map Anything, yep. um, you know, just announcing its, its acquisition by Salesforce. I mean, you've got 
and, and you know, Abbott Exchange is on that path, and you've got Passport, and you've got these, um, and Red Ventures, and, and you, what you hope, to your point, is that, the, that these leaders come, come dive back in, right, sure. and that they help support those that are, that are coming up behind them, and they're widening that path. Um, it's a really exciting time to be here for that reason. Absolutely. I, I came from the D.C. area, and we, we had a similar event when AOL um, IPO'd, and then yeah. um, it, it, it created, I don't know if it's 2,700 millionaires, but it was certainly on that order of magnitude, yeah. and, and probably four or five billionaires, and VC funds came out of that, and all, it's just all, all sorts of, it's a great multiplier effect, so... Um, I'll get off my soapbox there. <laughs> uh, what was, now correct me if I'm wrong, your first round you raised from the Charlotte Angel Fund, is that correct? Charlotte Angel Fund led our first round. Okay, yep. excellent. We raised 900,000. 900,000, okay. Mm -hmm. what, what was that experience like? Because we hear people complain about raising money real early stage in, in Charlotte. Um, and I, I talk a lot about this. I, I think some of the... <laughs> Complaints are more about the entrepreneur than the scene itself, but but I'd be curious what your experience was since you successfully went through and did it. Yeah, I mean we did it, so I guess I guess to to say that you know it, it worked out. I mean it was it was definitely new. It was the first time I'd ever raised capital. Um, you know it's you know people people complain about there not being a lot of capital here, and and relatively that's that's true, but there are people who care and and. There's capital when you when you seek it out, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, it's funny because I, I have come to to admire and respect Greg Brown for um, how he has managed Charlotte managed Charlotte Angel Fund and everything he's done in the community to help really continue to support entrepreneurs. Um, and you know, my process with them was just it was the first time I'd gone through it, so I had no baseline. But I mean, I I felt like it was a very equal trade of of um, you know getting down to how how can we put a put our bet on you right mm -hmm. like show you know prove that out they asked the right questions um there was there was the right amount of pushback that i think you know so initially i still have that email when um <laughs> and Greg, greg's gonna love this because i'm sure he remembers he sent me an email very early on that was like you're not a fit for us like charlotte and fun you know the, there's there's the scaling potential it's not really tech you know it's not really technical or technology enabled and I, you know, we, and we went through a couple iterations before, you know, they actually ended up leading the round, but, you know, I think it's, you, you just, it's persistence, right? And it's sure. taking feedback and understanding where people are coming from. And then, you know, m just pushing forward and, and doing as best as you can. Um, well, I and learned, you understand from Greg's perspective, if you take yeah. that, that critical feedback and take your dodgeball and go home, you're probably not going to be successful. You're yeah. going to see way worse things than that kind of feedback. Uh, from uh, yeah. your customers and your partners and oh absolutely yeah. like no is never no yeah. <laughs> like, you just you got to keep fighting but at, yeah. at the same time like you know you have to have some, you have to have a, a business that can scale you know you should be you should have a proof you should have a proof of concept that demonstrates some kind of product market fit right mm -hmm. and and you need to figure out the levers that make your business a viable business that other people would want to invest their their money into I think that you know d knowing the the background of investors is really important so when some people come from more risk philic or more risk averse backgrounds it really mm -hmm. changes the conversation um early stage startup is hard it's a yep. bet it's a gamble right mm -hmm. a lot of times you're putting money into companies that are pre-revenue right they haven't even proven that they can sell that there's a, a client willing to buy what they're trying to sell um and so a lot of it is you, you kind of have to it's, it's gut you have to um, you have to go with the people, you know, your reaction to the people who are leading it. And for us, when we came to the table, we had bootstrapped our company to the point where we had, we had revenue, right? So mm -hmm. we were showing traction. Um, and it was more about can this traction grow and scale and how would we be able to do that? And, and I think, you know, one of the reasons why it's, you know, parlaying that into our second round, you know, we, we've been able to do that, you mm -hmm. know, pretty, pretty successfully. And I think we've been able to tell a story that really laid out um, what we had more or less predicted in, in, the, in the beginning. Obviously, there's been some tweaks and some changes as to be expected. But, I mean, I am most proud of the fact that when I say we'll do something and we ended up being able to do it, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I really put a lot of, you know, of personal pride in, in coming back to someone and an investor who I have a fiduciary responsibility to saying, like, I put your money to really good use, right? Sure. Said I was going to do this, and I did it. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think following through on your commitments is one of the things that 
that, that is most important, especially when you go to raise that second round. So it sounds like the second round was a little bit easier for you. Do you attribute that to your track record or do you attribute it to you were just better at doing it because you had done it before or maybe a little bit of both? Well, not going to we're still We're still in the middle of it. So we're about to close. Um, it's been, I mean, we're more established in the community, right? So people people know us and I think they've been able to, to understand um, and believe in, in, the, in our traction more because we've just had more time to mm -hmm. show that growth. Um, honestly, like we've had some major uplifts, like with tech stars, like mm -hmm. getting introduced to the tech stars community, um, and and the um, this the caliber of investors that came with that has been a huge driver, mm -hmm. not just to my our ability to fundraise, um, but also just where we've been able to position the company because of what we learned, um, and who we became because of that twelve week program and the people and the people in it. So I feel like we've had we've really leveled up. Over mm -hmm. the last year, and and that's all contributed to to being able to to be successfully raise the second round, um, and I'm obviously you know I've learned a lot, um, mm -hmm. and I came at this you know knowing you know where I could have done better, and and getting that feedback, and then and then applying it this time, and just being a little smarter about about who's a better fit, who's a, a good fit for this company, and and who who is the right kind of um, supporter and investor who's going to you know be able to. And provide intrinsic value and, and push us forward. Um, you know, I have I have a much better sense of, of who that is now. That's great. That's great. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about the experience of starting a company with your husband, because obviously you, that's a great support network. You two know each other very well, and and you can connect in ways that other business partners can't. But I'd like to know what was the hardest part about it, other than I'm sure all of the kind of Captain Obvious objections that every would-be investor raises <laughs> along the way. Um, and some of them may be well-founded, but what, what's the hardest part about starting a company with your husband? Yeah, and I'm sure they are. I mean, I don't think it's for everybody. It worked for us. Um, mm -hmm. So Sebastian recently transitioned out of the company, mm -hmm. um, and that was an intentional move, and we are lucky enough to be at a place where we could hire for a specialized skill set um, so that he was able to, 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 to really see what he's built and then and then move on from that. Um, I The hardest part, I... The hardest part is being able to 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 successfully compartmentalize all of the different roles you play in a marriage and in a business partnership when those two things are when those two two things overlap. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to get really good at you know at dropping the business hat and putting on the like husband and wife hat, like when we were making dinner, right? Like it had to you had to be able to let things go and you had to be able to transition from conversation to conversation depending on. You know who we were going to be in that moment um, because there were so many dimensions to our relationship I would say that the, you know it was it was stressful like I think we improved our communication skills improved because they were pushed to so many limits right it was just constantly stressful when and you know working with your spouse when when you are you, know, you have expectations and, and they have expectations of you mm -hmm. and then you're also trying to like make a, a personal relationship work that's that's totally outside of scope of of, of like building a, a high growth startup and you, you don't want to, you know, you, you don't want to lose either, uh, either of those things or the integrity that, that really is the foundation of them. And I mean, I, I think um, my biggest regret and I think the hardest thing about is that it, it's just easy to kind of um, offload and, and, you know, get a little bit more um, show you know show your ass a little bit more yeah, yeah. right because you know it's your husband and yeah. you're like you know upset and yeah. things aren't going well and it's like you you take it out on you each other you can swing a little harder you can swing a little harder right because <laughs> um, and and that we you know we had to just identify and stop and and um, but like again like his his support and my support of him I would ne it has been one of my biggest personal accomplishments to have been able to work side by side with Sebastian. That's right? awesome. Like the coolest thing yeah, that we yeah. did this. And I can't wait to do it again. When you two compliment each other very well. Yeah, and I think that also yeah. helps. So like knowing that, right? Like yeah. these are the things like you're you'll stay at. in your lane, he's staying yeah. in his. Yes. And that's like comes with self awareness and you have to have that going in because I mean he, he is good at so many things that I really lack in and that compatibility is you know, is what kind of keeps us going. Um but yeah, I mean it was definitely trying and I, you know, will forever be grateful for him putting up with me for. Well, that's great. So I'd like to talk a little bit about TechStars, um, and, and maybe you could just give a really quick introduction for those listening who who may not know know any of the details. But in particular, how many times did you you know did you apply multiple times before you got in? 
um, what was the biggest value you got from it and how connected have you stayed in, into that community? Yeah, so Techstars is, um, is uh, an impact accelerator program for high growth startups. They um, are all over the country, all over the world, and they pick 10 companies every year um, out of thousands of applications. So it's really an honor to, to go through the selection mm -hmm. process and end up being selected. And then they work, it's pretty much like college for startups. So they workshop you, you go live in the city that the, the, the Techstars um, office is located in. And they do all of these business workshops. They, they um, really invite you into this, this lifelong community of mentors and investors and Techstars alum. And the whole motto, the whole, motto, the whole MO is give first. Mm -hmm. And they really do live that. Um, everybody is, is just willing to lend a hand at any time, right? You ask a question and they're gonna, if they can't answer it, they're gonna find somebody else in the network that can. Um, it is just community on a whole new level. We, um, we applied to the Austin program um, after my good friends, Dan and Alex, who run to you laundry, had gone through mm -hmm. the, um, the Atlanta program, and then Lisa Ganderson through WebClick had, had done Austin as well. And so we applied, and um, immediately when I met the managing director, Amos, I was just sold. I just believed in him, and I, I said, I, how, do I be, how do I get to be part of this? Because mm -hmm. this is, if, if you are any indication of the caliber of this program, then I will that's would great. Like tooth and nail to. And how long did you have to relocate to Austin? We, it was a it was a twelve week program, but I ended up staying around um, several months longer because we ended up launching in Austin. Mm -hmm. um, so that was beginning of last year. The program was from January to April, and I stayed I stayed in Austin through September. So I was wow. living there, and Sebastian came home. So, um, so yeah, so got so much value out of out of TechStars, and still still do. Um, I go back. Amos is on our board, so. Um, you know, I'm in touch with, with them all of the time, and, and there's been several classes since then that have gone through the program that I've been able to come back and speak to and, and be mentors to as well. And it's just a great feeling of like people that are so bought into the mission of helping others, right? Like that all of our success, like, you know, combines to, to make a, a sum that's greater than our parts. And, you know, ultimately, the co some companies fail, some companies, you know, can have positive exits. But it doesn't matter because we're all like kind of aligned in this and we know that things are going to shuffle. And so, you know, I look at people and I'm like, yeah. I'm going to work with you someday. <laughs> right. Like I, I know our that's paths awesome. are going to continue to, to, to cross. And that's just a cool feeling. That is. That's very cool. Did you talk to any other similar programs or did you talk to them and knew right away that they were the one? I didn't really. I didn't. I mean, knew of them. <laughs> and I was like, no, I, I, this kind of this is where I want to be. Um, I, yeah. I did something similar when I wanted to get an MBA. Like, OK, I. I applied to Duke. I got in, and I was like, "I'm not applying anywhere else." Like, I, I, was, I was just going to take the first one that I liked enough to. Yeah. Get into. <laughs> but sometimes that's the right, you know, that's just the right decision anyway. Yeah, yeah. So very, very interesting. Um, so, so you raised nine hundred thousand in your first round, and I think I read about a, a very large capital raise happening, maybe within weeks, in your industry um, with Wag. That's got to be either unnerving or. The, just what the hell was it? Three hundred million dollars that they raised mm -hmm. from SoftBank. Yeah, well, Sorry. it's funny because I remember when I woke up to the news, and you know, raising the first round, we had just closed. Well, we were like, we were, we were about to close our first round, and a lot of the resistance, or at least the questions that I'd gotten, you know, in our first round was, you know, is this really a, a fundable market? Like, <laughs> is there money here? And I, the first thing I thought of was like, well, <laughs> that's no longer an yeah. excuse. <laughs> Um, but no, I think it, it well, I, I kind of was excited. Initially, when I read about it, I was like, you know what? This is great. It validates our market, yep. right? So clearly, like, clearly something's happening here, right? Mm -hmm. Pet care trends, the, the amount of disposable income that's going to pets, how pets are members of the family, like, there, there is something here, and that has just been validated in a major way. Second is... Well, they run ads all the time, so... Right. Well, yeah. Yeah, but... Yeah. And, I mean, that builds awareness that the industry even exists. And if you can deliver a better experience, which you appear to from the... And that's exactly what it was. I mean, not only was, was it validating the market, but then WAG and others help educate our future customers, mm -hmm. right? So they, they the, the brand awareness is strong. They put a lot of money in ads. Mm -hmm. And then when those customers are trite, which they inevitably do, because the, you know, there's, there's significant quality control problems, they come to us. And so yeah. we found it to actually be a source, a, a client um, acquisition source. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, and, and honestly, and this is something that we feel very strongly, I do, our team does, 
we look at these at, at the way these marketplace models are operating when it comes to taking care of pets and going into homes, and it's just not the right way to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And we stand by the fact that we are doing it the right way, and we have this moral imperative to succeed because, you know, the, the if if we don't, it's at the peril of of pets and their pet parents, right? It's just, you know, and and all of the things that we've done to just just we, to just continue to, to focus on like that client experience and, and really being there for the pet parent and for the pet and selling that trust. And, and, and I hear about it in the news, how like when, when, when these other companies make mistakes, how they go about it and they try to send hush money and it's just, it's just so divisive and it's such a transactional way to approach the people's relationship to their pets. And we are just on, on, on such an, the other side of the spectrum. And if we can make this work, from a unit economic standpoint, and we can really scale something that that is just so focused on delivering a high quality, controlled, consistent experience. Like I, I just I feel like we have this this almost higher higher mission now to mm -hmm. do that. I've, I've found that most successful companies find that higher mission. Yeah, it makes it easier to <laughs> yeah to deal with the the, the highs <laughs> and the lows yeah, for sure. That's true. So I don't know if the two were related, but can you talk a little bit? about the process of changing the name. Um, and just full disclosure, I've been through three company name changes now. So Yeah, I want to hear about that. <laughs> I want to, um, did you add extra V in or like what's the, <laughs> what's the um, Yeah, we so we, we were the Waggle Company and so we had a trademark on, on the Waggle Company and we did our research. I, I wanted to make sure we were we were protected because Wag was was in the market and mm -hmm. um, so it was a couple of things. One, you know, there was there was some brand association that we wanted to, to disassociate with. We had I have a I have a funny story. So we had a client call in one day and was and was so mad. She was like, "You missed you missed our you missed my dog walk. You nobody oh, no. showed up." <laughs> and you know that doesn't happen with us because sure. we have we like we have this back end technology that we can we route every visit and we see it in real time. So we don't miss visits as sure. you can see. But she was like, "You missed the visit. You missed the visit." And we're like, "Well, let's let's take a look and see what happened." And so we went back into our system and we don't see her we don't see her 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 appointment there. And we said, can you send us a screenshot of like what you're oh, talking no. <laughs> about? And like, oh, yeah. So she sends she just sent a screenshot of, of the WAG confirmation. So it was WAG who missed her appointment. But we were, <laughs> but she thought she booked it with us. And I was like, oh man, like, okay, like how, how many signs? Sure. <laughs> so there was. There you're was, also breathing easily at that point. You're like, I how know, often like, is this happening? <laughs> I know, sure. I know, right? It was kind of this like little this little insight. Um, yeah, and, and so obviously, you know, we all had a joke about it, and then, you know, she got signed up for us, and, 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 and the appointments that we never missed going forward, but, uh, but wait, so, so part of it was to disassociate um, from competitors that had a similar branding, but another part of it was that when we went through Techstars, a big part of that was really understanding what our mission was, and, and what our brand identity was, mm -hmm. and how we were messaging and communicating to clients and potential clients, and what we realized were was there's two fundamental components of what we do. It's the trust aspect first, and then it's adventure. It's okay. those two things that really create the skipper, the skipper experience. And we were looking for a brand name that would really embody that sense of being a captain of your own adventure. Okay. Um, and Skipper was really that for us. It's a friendly movement, similar with Waggle, like a wagging tail, but Skipper is like a frolicky, you know, sure. happy movement. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, we really identified with that. And also we had the opportunity with Skipper to really, to, to broaden our horizons past potentially pet care if we ever so choose. Um, Waggle, you know, was a little bit more specific to, to pets and, and, you know, what we do well is sell trust and deliver this high quality personalized service. And we wanted to be able to, you know, be able to expand upon that should we choose. And, and Skipper made a lot of sense for us. So. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm really happy with it. It was quite a process. I'm like, we went through so many graphic designers to, to, to figure out our logo. And then eventually like we weren't happy with any of them that we just went on the whiteboard and we're like, well, this is kind of what we want. And then we all looked at it and we're like, yeah, that's it. That's like, great. Just do that. And we ended up like doing it ourselves. So it felt very, or it, it, it felt, um, it felt very organic. It felt, it very, felt very authentic and, and true to ourselves. Um, but yeah, we've, we've liked it. So tell me about your three name change. Okay, so the first one was, was a no-brainer. I was working for a company called Distributed Objects. Okay. It was a startup, and just a horrible name, um, Distributed Programming Objects. It's a real geeky, technical <laughs> name. And we had shortened it to Docs 
I think our head of marketing at the time said, well, let's just call it Docs because that, that sounds cool. And that was, I guess, marginally better. But then the company just decided as we started to scale that we needed a, a name that better reflected who we were. And so we changed the name to Amentra because we had developed the mentoring model that really we built all of our branding around that mentoring model. So it worked really well. That was uh, the company that um, was sold to Red Hat in 2008. Um, and it's how I spent a couple of years at Red Hat. Second name change, we start a company I did with a couple of friends and investors called IntelliGrid. It was a smart grid company. We loved the name. Um, I, I filed the trademark with the USPTO and they pointed out in the paperwork, hey, there's a similarly named, phonetically named, similar, similarly named phonetically um, product or service offering. Not a product, but a service offering. It's spelled differently, but phonetically it's, it's identical. And they said, we don't think it's a problem, but just be aware. And so we asked the attorney, and the attorney is like, look, that's, that's not even a product. It's a service offering from a nonprofit industry association. You'll be fine. Clear. So we get big enough to where this industry association figures out who we are. And I get a letter from, from their attorney <laughs> saying, we're prepared to it's sue. It's always a letter, right? Well, like, <laughs> and, I, and actually, I take that back. They weren't prepared to sue. They had filed a suit in the West North Carolina court. And so... <laughs> I sent it to our attorney at the time and I said, what do you suggest? And she said, well, look, you've, you've got a 50-50 chance that you'll win this thing. Like, this is not cut and dry. She's like, but there's a 100% chance that you'll spend between one hundred and two hundred fifty thousand dollars mm -hmm. yeah. in legal fees. And so I met with my partners and our investors and we talked and we changed the name to NextGrid um, and still had a $25,000 legal fee <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just to wave the white flag and say, okay, we're yeah. changing the name. And then, uh, Level actually did not start out as Level. Chris and I, so I don't, I don't know how much of this story you know, but Chris and I had started another product company together. We were in the process of pivoting it, and both of our employers at the time, literally on the same day, saw our launch on the App Store because it got picked up by Apple. It was pretty big news, and both of them fired us that day. And I, and I said, Chris, you know, um, like, let's just go do some consulting. And he said, all right, cool. I was like, I can get us some work through Pivotal, which was a company that EMC had spun out and uh, out of VMware. And, um, and so we called them and said, hey, we're, you know, we're available to do work. And they said, great, we've got some project work next week, but we need a business name you know, if you're not gonna do it as individuals. So we just picked the name Lada Partners. Lada is, was the first or last name of Dilworth. Um, uh -huh. So there was Edward Latta Dilworth, I think yeah. it was the middle name. So there's a bunch of things in Charlotte that sure. are named Latta. Yeah. And we were just like, all right, well, let's just call it Latta Partners. We can get that name. And then when we grew to about 20 people, we attracted a third partner who invested in the company. And ironically, he was the one who changed the name of Distributed Objects to Amentra. And he was like, your name sucks. You're like, like your naming views. <laughs> yeah, so, like, exactly. Came down. <laughs> but but at, at this point, you know, we, we hired a firm who... who yeah. To, to, to come up with the name and, and they picked the two Vs from day one but ironically enough we almost didn't get the like we almost couldn't use the name level I went and looked up the name level but the domain level.com uh -huh. and it was available and then we said okay we've picked it we're good to go so we emailed the marketing firm and we said run with it and then then I go to secure the domain name and somebody had taken it, a small two-person VC shop in, in uh, Sweden. And oh, so, so we're like, oh, we gotta go back to the drawing board. But then Pivotal, our partner at the time, had just switched their domain from gopivotal.com to pivotal.io. And we were like, oh, IO is cool, that's techie. So we switched it to level.io. And now it's very common for tech companies yeah. to do the .io. So you're like a trend center. No, well, well I think we'd give that, I'd give that trend to, to Pivotal. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, cool. but, but we were we were early to do it. And luckily, when, when we bought it, it was a cheaper domain. Now, if you try to register a .io, oh, yeah. it, it costs more because a lot of tech companies do it. But yeah. it just shows you the kind of, things that come at you where you realize like I've got to change the name whether it's a lawsuit in our case yep. or in your case confusion coming from a competitor who you want to dis not be associated with right and, and, and it's avoiding resource loss yeah. like you said like the legal fees and just yep. the, the distraction that would be and you're yep. like I'm I want to I I fine like, yeah yeah I just, we'll, I we'll change the our right name. flag yeah. Or, yeah exactly yeah so um 
so obviously you're a woman in tech and clearly having a lot of success and congratulations on that. Um, talk to me, why do you think so few women make the jump into entrepreneurship? It, 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 are, are there unique challenges? Are there expectations? Is it just something that takes time or, or what? You know, and obviously we can't solve this in one podcast, but I'd love to get your thoughts as somebody who's breaking that trend. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I like it back to just exposure mm -hmm. for girls in general. I mean, there's like there's so much research that shows that um, that girls are are given fewer opportunities that really match their interest and their skills um, when it comes to um, science, math, engineering, tech. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it, in any kind of male dominated field, it's hard. It, it really kind of boxes out um, other, other people, whether mm -hmm. it's different, different um, sexes, different um, ethnicities. And I think that's changing. Um, I am really like honored to be a part of uh, Project Scientist, which is an academy for young girls that, that um, creates a summer curriculum that's- Yeah, Stratified and I just sponsored one of their oh, events they're Connect for Charity. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. cool, yeah, so, so I go talk to them. Um, you know, I talk to the girls like, during their summer, their summer program and it's, it's so cool, right? Yeah. And like, we didn't have that growing up. And I see them like after, they, after we, you know, I do their talk and I do the talk and, and meet them, they, they go run out and they go build a mobile app. Like that's like the next thing on the list. Mm -hmm. and, it's it's so cool to see the opportunities that that young girls are having now that I that I think is really changing the landscape and the paradigm for for who they will become and you know I am proud to like you know see that happening. Mm -hmm. um, I think that part of me feels like any success we have, I hope whether it's recognized or not as that it widens the path for people who are coming up, mm -hmm. specifically women, right? And if it makes it easier for them in any way. Um, as as the women before me have done, right, in ways that I, I maybe can acknowledge or just don't know. I think that is so remarkable, and I think it's what legacy is about. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, I think it's really exciting. I think that, like, so I'm not a parent, but, but what I feel like there's an opportunity to do is for us to just be more aware and intentional about recognizing the gaps that exist between the opportunities that we offer to boys and girls and, and intentionally filling those gaps, like going above and beyond to offer those opportunities and, and really put young women and girls in the position to, to um, just explore their interests and their curiosities mm -hmm. in a way that goes beyond maybe what has been state defined for them as yep. part of like the status quo and I think Project Scientist is doing such a great job with that. That, um, that event was awesome. They had a couple of the girls get up and talk about their science projects and if, if you reach people early enough and they yeah. and especially once they start to see people who look like them and that they're yes. friends with doing it. it and makes that's it what it's all easier. about. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's having role models and putting and putting them you know center stage and yeah no 100% and that's cool that you sponsored it because I, I yeah I, I feel like those that will become more the norm as we as as time goes on and and um i think we have like a duty to to help facilitate that yep. so, yeah. now you strike me as someone who isn't afraid to mix it up with the guys <laughs> 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 not everybody has that kind of personality male or male or female but <laughs> is that required for women in tech well, in startups or maybe everybody that's required for. <laughs> yeah, that's really funny. Um, <laughs> I think it's just because I'm like one unabashedly like I there's never been a person I've met that I have not been able to learn from. Mm -hmm. And I, um, you know, I just enjoy the company of others. Mm -hmm. I, I do have a lot of guy friends. I had a lot of guy friends in college. You know, it's funny now um, having me being an entrepreneur. I have some of the close my closest female relationships who are other Mm -hmm. founders um, and CEOs because um, Haley Bohan is an example of skill pop mm -hmm. um, Lisa Ganderson of the web click because we it's hard what we do sure. right like it's it takes, it takes like a lot of a lot of vulnerability a lot of a lot of self-awareness a lot of strength a lot of persistence and um, we you know definitely feel like we're few of many um, and, and it's funny because in, in this time of my life, I, I have some of my closest in my relationships because of, of the nature of, of the work that I do. Um, but yeah, no, I, I feel like, um, being able to be empathetic and, and enjoy the company of anybody, you know, mm -hmm. you know, is, is 
part of kind of what I've always been about and it comes very naturally to me. That's great. That's awesome. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, maybe get into a little bit of detail on just business models. Cause I think you're, you talked a little bit about your strategic shift away from just the dog walking into um, partnerships with the apartment buildings. And that, that seems like you're, you're maybe changing, not the business model. It's, it's still core to the, it's still the core business model, but it's, it just strikes me as, as, as maybe more scalable or less one-to-one -one selling, or maybe you could just talk about kind of that transition. Yeah. So, so when we started, it became, um, we started as a dog walking service. Well, actually, I'll take that back. We were a um, seven day a week, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. service. And then about a year in, we realized that our kind of m more repeatable revenue generated client was a, as, and, and our, was a, was a weekday client. Mm -hmm. And so we scaled our hours back um, to be Monday to Friday, um, which was a big pivot in the business. So we really kind of concentrated mm -hmm. our focus, which, you know, was, was, was a big change. I remember when we sent that email out. Um, and then Seb, Seb and I went to the dog park to like let our dogs run around and I remember get, getting People all the, oh my gosh, it was so angry. Like, cause, cause our vacation clients didn't understand. They, you know, they emailed me back being like, well, what do you do if yeah. you're only Monday to Friday? And I remember being like, and it's just fair, right? Cause we had two very different clients at the time. We had clients who used us while they were at work during the, the work day from Monday to Friday, and then we had clients who use this when they went on vacation, so twice a year for a, a full week. And it was a, a very different use case and a very different service offering. And what we realized was is that we weren't able to do as, as great of a job for, we couldn't be all things to all people. And that's when we really had to decide, like this is who we're gonna be and what we're gonna focus on. Um, but yeah, I remember that was a, that was like such a moment when we were like, okay, we're gonna like push send on this. Like we're gonna like, we're gonna like take off like, 20% of our hours right now and just yeah. totally confuse like a, a, a large, you know, significant part of our client base. Well, imagine, um, imagine what Netflix went through when they said, we're, we're not, we're going away from DVDs. We're going to do streaming or recently. I don't know if you saw the Disney announcement on Disney yes. plus, but they pulled all their content from Netflix, which is hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars in annual revenue sure. that they're walking away from. And billions of dollars that they're investing into a platform, right? That that, that, that may or may not work, so right? It's, it's, right. It's amazing. But then, that, no, absolutely. Well, it's funny because Sebastian comes from like a Disney family, and so we are very pro Disney at the Williams household. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, we'll subscribe to that. Like yeah, we are yeah. going to be like, like because they're six ninety nine. I think I'm going to subscribe. Yeah, to. <laughs> right. They're going to pull stuff out of like the vault. Yeah. Like sign me up. Like yeah. I don't want the old Disney shows. Yeah. So so yeah. So we went through a bunch of pivots. Um, and, and so we're used to that, and it's all about really finding the opportunity and where the value prop is. So we started as you know full pet care, in-home pet care, moved to dog walking, opened our hours back up for weekends when we realized that the, now we had the processes that could scale that. And then over the last year, and I looked at this, I looked at this data recently, and it's fascinating. We had 14% of our client base was um, residents, multifamily, mm -hmm. so li like lived in an apartment. Today, and it, it, what do you know what that number is in Charlotte? Is is fourteen percent pretty consistent with what? So Charlotte it was fourteen percent of our of our current client base at the time. Sure. Was um was an apartment dwelling resident. I'm I'm curious if that's if that's roughly what like what percent of Charlotte residents. No, are, I think it's much lower. It's much lower. Okay. Yeah. Well, depending on the zip codes you're targeting. Gotcha. Um, but over the last year, we've grown that percentage. Now we intend we've intentionally done that, but also it's it's been somewhat organic. We've grown that from 14% to over 55% wow. of our client base is now represented by apart uh, apartment dwellers. And do you find that you can like batch together 10 or 12 dogs at one time if you're in yeah. the same building? Well, the, to the, the whole business model changes, right? Mm -hmm. So when we focus on density, which which is what we do, because we um, you know we we pay our team members a, a living wage, right? Mm -hmm. We and that's part of who we are. Is like we are putting we have W two employees, mm -hmm. so we don't use contractors. And for people who like. Who, who are familiar with the difference, there's significant impact to that. Sure. Um, we really invest in our team so that we can invest in our clients. And so our, our team members are paid an hourly wage um, and they're paid for drive time. So when we staff team members at an apartment where they're not driving because they're able to do more visits at once, we're able to really increase our, our, our margins there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it became a, a density game for us. And, and we also recognize that people who live in apartments who have dogs, which now 
represents over 50% of the apartment community is a, wow. is, a, is a dog owner, not just pet owner, a dog owner. And in the last 15 years, that's gone from practically nothing to what it is today. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's kind of like all these tidal forces that are coming together at the same time, where you have all of these dogs in apartments. In a 300-unit apartment, you can expect around 150 dogs, which is wow. insane, right? Wow. Um, and then you also have, for, from our standpoint, the density that really makes sense. And we bring to market a very curated, personalized, quality-controlled approach that apartments really resonate with, right? Because mm-hmm. they can't scale. They can't let their reputation be um, held hostage by marketplaces that can't guarantee that quality. Mm-hmm. And we are here to say, not only are we going to guarantee that quality, we're going to go to every building that you're in, and we can do it right now. It seems like the other market force that's out there is just the fight between these apartments to attract uh, a younger crowd with amenities, right? Yeah. And they're, it, it, how many gyms can you add or pools? Right. Or, so. They call it an amenities arms race. Yeah. Um, and pet owners are a focus. And so what we are trying to do is really pioneer the new standard of pet care amenities at apartments. Um, we are uniquely positioned to do that because of our foundation in dog walking and everything that we've learned mm-hmm. from how to be great at Well, having a scalable techno- digital yeah. platform, because you couldn't do this if it was just, hey, call me up, I'll schedule one of my four yeah, dog walkers. 100%. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, so really it goes back to level. Like that, That's what at I was getting at. <laughs> <laughs> I'll drink to that. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Um, yeah. Level had very little to do with their success, for the record. <laughs> no, it was it was de- it was the launching pad to where we are now, for for sure. And it, it is it's technic it's technology based. Um, being able to to be a high touch service through um through a low touch kind of automated technology platform is is incredible mm-hmm. and is unprecedented. I I I think I struggle because I cannot find another and I want to because I want to talk to them. I cannot find another service based company. That is, you know, especially one that goes in home. So it's an in-home access service mm-hmm. company that has been able to scale and scales on technology and really continue to deliver a very curated, personalized um, approach. Um, you know, across different verticals or markets or through different channel partners, whatever it may be. Certainly in the Carolinas and maybe yeah. most of the southeast that would be hard to find it's just yeah. not a business model that a lot of companies are sure are, are, are going after yeah. and that, kudos to you guys for making it work for sure um well that no that that's great that that's interesting to be able to, to shift your strategy it isn't a broad shift in strategy but it is a, a, a different kind of change in your mindset of how you're yeah. how you're selling and how you're going after customers that's great but i assume that you're still seeing growth in the more standard one at a time guerrilla marketing that you're doing yeah so we kind of have our feet in 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 both pools right now so we are very actively continuing to grow our dog walking arm and then we're also exploring the opportunities with apartments and what that means as kind of the preferred service for on-site pet care Mm -hmm. Um, we recently had um, a press release go live about our partnership with northrop raven and building out on-site facilities that can cater to um dog pet owners dog owners specifically through daycare and and boarding and grooming and then that you know continues to just add to our scope that currently really occupies the dog walking space and that's where I go back to just you know I think that the pet parent experience is something that really has has been untouched and how can you how can you really revolutionize that with technology with people who care with um, processes that are scalable healthy unit economics and this just real focus on just like delivering a sense of trust and adventure with with every with every interaction and i we want to do that that's great so i'd like to we talked a little bit about the charlotte scene more from in the context of of, of raising money here um and, and i think not just in charlotte but across the country there are just a lot of entrepreneurs operating in smaller i'll call it second or third tier cities like like charlotte um and, and these cities don't really have the pedigree that some of the bigger cities you know like a dc going with an aol and an mci and other similar explosive um uh, type of, of anchor uh, companies or or you mentioned dell in in austin was, was certainly um cer- certainly uh, the catalyst there but can you speak a little bit about the challenges you perceive due to where we operate? Um, but maybe on the flip side, you could talk about some of the advantages that smaller cities like 
ourselves in Raleigh and Richmond, Tampa, Nashville, Columbus. Because obviously companies are making it happen. We've got eight or nine or 10 or 12 really good examples here in Charlotte, whereas we might have had two or three 10 years ago. But what, you know, what do you think are some of the trade-offs between operating in those smaller cities? Well, I mean, from an advantage side, I think there's two things. Um, in a place like Charlotte, and I, I've said this before, and I, mm -hmm. I believe in, in the entrepreneurial community and how collaborative and close-knit it, it is, mm -hmm. because there are not that many of us, and it feels like because capital may be you know, finite or restricted, that it means more, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the, the companies that survive really you know, had to push hard to do it. You know, I liken it back to you know my days um, at at Moveloo, where we raised twenty million dollars and our burn rate was a million dollars a month, and it was just, it wasn't taken seriously. And sure. I think about like how we were just so focused, like when Seb and I were putting our personal savings on the line, and we you know we took out that SBA loan that was leveraged on our house, like every dollar mattered, mm -hmm. right? And you wore multiple hats, you appreciated every dollar that went out, and you were just so hyper focused. Mm -hmm. on 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 what the return was and and just constantly reassessing and reevaluating what you were doing and having that appreciation i think has built a model built a a, a more scalable model because we were resource constrained sure. right we we did more with less well it's like japan after world war ii they were resource constrained and they created new ways of building cars that Turn them into the world's best Absolutely. cars. Absolutely, it's almost like like limitations. You know, are the impetus for creativity, mm -hmm. and that's what I feel like we've done. Um, and so I think there's tremendous advantage to just being in that mindset all the time. Sure. Um, and then I'd say second is so so it, the you know the, the big you know the bigger cities the the the, the big city kids like call them they mm -hmm. get like all of this funding and there's tons of mentors out there right. But I feel like there are fewer degrees of separation for the fewer mentors that exist in smaller cities, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have access to people that where I think would be a lot harder to form, you know, formative relationships with should we be in tier one, tier two cities. And I count that. That is as so true. I haven't even thought about that. But in, in Charlotte, yeah. you know somebody who knows Garth Moulton or Chris Halligan or right. you know, exactly. some, some of these luminaries yeah. who yeah, absolutely. Right. I'm sitting here talking to the former CEO of Level. Like that's incredible. Like you were too kind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> um, so talk to me a little bit about how you, how you set goals at this stage in the company and maybe how that's shifted through the years. Is it growth based on top line, bottom line, number of users? How, how do you think about that? Obviously, there's no right answer and that changes over time. Yeah, I mean, we look at a lot of things. Also, at the end of the day, we need to make money, and 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 revenue is a big driver to to how we kind of m measure our success. I would say that revenue is a function of of two things: it's new clients coming in, and it's um the attrition on existing clients. And so we mm -hmm. measure that pretty. So churn's closely. a big one for churn's you. Churn's a big one. Mm -hmm. Um, and and honestly, I think that's how we were really able to raise our first round of funding. We were this you know, unknown dog walking company that in a, in a business was seen as unsexy because nobody had put money into dog walking before. And what we showed is that we had really high client loyalty, mm -hmm. right? We, our cohort analysis, when we, when we looked at, at user engagement over time for a transactional business, we, we're not a subscription model, it's pay as you go. Um, we just showed just very high loyalty, very high usage rates um, that really defied kind of what the, the, the kind of standard was. Um, and that is something we still continue to look at. Right? What is our lifetime value of a client? How much does it cost to acquire them? And then we're very sensitive to cost to some extent, and we're, we're, you know, we're raising funding, and so we're, we're reinvesting back into the, um, you, know, you know, setting ourselves up for, for, for future growth. Um, but, I mean, unit economics is a big part of what so we're doing. So has your customer acquisition costs gone down over time, or does it go up, or...? So depending on where, so in new markets it's gone up, but mm -hmm. mostly because we rely so heavily on word of mouth growth. Mm -hmm. Forty five percent of our clients come from word of mouth. That's great. Um, and yeah, we love that. I mean, I feel like in a perfect world you wouldn't have to do marketing, right? Because your brand ambassadors would be the clients who just testify to to the the value of the experience they've had. Um, and then in new markets, and that's something we learned, right? Is how to get that flywheel turning when you go into new markets. You don't have that existing client base. And so you have to get exposure elsewhere, and it costs more um, initially. And um, and yeah, so we've learned a lot about that. It's in Charlotte, it stayed relatively the same, and in Austin, and Dallas are very different because the the, the the makeup and the fabric of of, 
of, of, of people there are, and their motivations are different. And we've learned a lot about that, which we knew we would, mm-hmm. like trying to understand the nuances of, of different cities um, because we only had Charlotte as our baseline. And um, yeah, so it's been, it's been so many learnings and the team has been great. We are excited to you know, be a metrics driven company and that's mm-hmm. the goal. And that's something that was- Do you have a marketing team that drives that or who, who really drives the, the metrics? driven approach there is that is that coming from you or it's yeah so it comes from me we uh we recently integrated with tableau which has been a game changer because i feel like the ease of being able to access data to understand it was the biggest barrier to being kind of really metrics focused Mm -hmm. because it just took so long to get the data from our backend system so we recently integrated with tableau and and we do daily stand-ups now that everybody's responsible for one metric that they own weekly we do all hands calls where we kind of come together around what the, the, the you know, so we all are aware of what how we're doing and can get a good sense of the pulse on, yep. on, on progress. And then we have goals that we shoot to. So yeah, I mean, I think it's it's gotta be a focus, right? Because whatever sure. you don't analyze, you can't improve. Yep. Um, but the first step in that, and that nobody talks about is like, how do you gather that data, yeah. right? Like it's sure, like I can believe all day about analyzing, but if it's not easy to analyze, like how am I gonna be able to do it? And so we've, we've now figured out the integrations to, to, to really bring that data to light in a way that can be useful, not just to me, not just to the board, the leadership team, but everybody in the company. Well, and the first step there is you have to digitize the process yes. to begin with. Because when you weren't managing everything through a web app and, right. and a mobile app, you right. imagine trying to measure that. Yeah. Exactly. You can't. It's yeah. not being captured. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is where technology really saves the day, is that yeah. we're able to get a very clean and, and very thorough sense of, of how our customers use us and engage with us, and um, we're able to capture all that data to, to then turn around and improve that experience for them. Great. So we talked about you're completing the second round of raising capital. How soon after the first round did you start? thinking about that well they always say that you're always raising mm-hmm. for like where we are and I believe that I mean you're you're always thinking about kind of what the next 10 moves are gonna be and you're kind of plotting that out and visualizing that and then pivoting when you need to just so that you can get a sense of like you know preparing yourself for the needs of the company going forward so honestly I think that's what our my role is now is how mm-hmm. do you anticipate future needs well right how do you learn from the gaps in the in the past where reality did not meet expectation. What was the learning there? And then how do I apply that moving forward? Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we're about to finish our second round and um, I'm thinking about what that means you know, to our investors now and how we're gonna set ourselves up for future growth and what that's gonna look like. And, and, and that's always been a part of the conversation. I think that's, that's good, right? It's, sure. it's part of the story. Like, and, so you're already thinking about the third round, I can yeah. tell. <laughs> I know, it never stopped. <laughs> What was different in the second round? We already talked about the fact that you were better established to to convince investors that this is a good investment. You've got a track record now, but talk maybe a little bit about your expectations because the first time you could say you would never raise money before, you can't say that the second time. Mm-hmm. So what was different from you for you from an expectations perspective? Um, well, you know, I, I had more confidence around what, what um, you know, what needed to be known, right? Mm-hmm. And and we have I've come I've come up with a, a cadence that I feel very good about that I that I feel like our our investors too. We have this this working and professional relationship that's all about transparency and openness and, and mm-hmm. sending regular updates and really keeping them in the loop. And what I've learned is how to um, is how to really be specific about the asks and the needs that we have at any given moment and who to go to for those things. Mm-hmm. And you know, I had no baseline going in in the, in the beginning and, and since that time being introduced to, to the, a world of investors that have been so supportive. And I know that people have, other entrepreneurs have different experiences, but I feel so grateful that not only our investors, but our board and then our advisors and everybody that's been around us has been such a value add mm-hmm. at every at every step of the way. And being able to channel that um, and, and, and really parlay that into, into launching kind of the next round was part of, I think, the, the success and why we were able to raise so quickly. Um, we also had a really great return rate of the investors that had invested in our first round, investing in our second, and I feel very proud of that. Um, right, that yeah. keep the the same group on board, um, and who still you know very much believe and. Well, yeah. I, I spoke with a couple of your 
investors from the first round and it was it became very apparent like okay yeah this, this makes sense yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> they, good. they were good. very enthusiastic good, supporters good, good. So. yeah no that's great and I think that's you know it's, it is and it's funny because it's like our company's about trust and I feel like that's what I that's what I'm about too mm -hmm. it's like let's have a great relationship where I can say like this is what I'm really struggling with right sure. you believe in me at the end of the day and I'm going to be open with you and I'm going to be vulnerable with you about what I feel like I'm struggling with and I'm not great at and I need help with Mm -hmm. How can we figure this out together? Yeah. And it's just, it's been great. It's, I could not be, like, again, more more grateful for the people that have been able to bring around me um, to help make this a success. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, getting other people interested in your cause is a testament to, to what you're doing. So, again, congratulations. So, we've talked a lot about the successes. You're given one mulligan for a decision you made in this whole process. Not raising money, just the entire <laughs> process. <laughs> What, what is there one decision that if you could make it differently, you, 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 you might consider it? Yeah, you know, it's so, I feel like everything we do gets us to where we are now. And like the, the, the idea for grants is like, I feel like I've always done the best I can in any moment, mm -hmm. right? And it's what's been able to get me to where I am. I, I think as like a, as a general theme, when I look back and I say, hey, these are the times when I learned the most mm -hmm. based on what I know now, it's when, it's when I engineered my own smallness because I was afraid of the outcome that I couldn't control. So this goes back to the origin story at oh, the very beginning. Yeah, where like all along. Seb and I are the only two that are allowed to touch anything. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. No, that was the first major moment, right? It's like we waited way too long to, 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 to push forward, to, to jump into that uncertainty and to figure out how to scale a business um, because we were scared, right? Because mm -hmm. there's fear. And I think it, there's always a fear and I've gotten better at being comfortable with that fear and mm -hmm. letting it fuel me rather than hold me back. And I, I constantly remind myself, like, is this fear that I'm feeling because I've actually made a risk assessment and I shouldn't go forward or because I'm scared of an outcome I can't control? Oh. And I'm, I'm now that I know these things, and like, and as I go forward, I feel much more, uh, much more apt at just like just stepping into the arena and and knowing that that I'm going to figure it out, and that mm -hmm. I'm going to be able to bring the right resources around me to figure it out. But in the beginning, you know, it just took longer to to be there. And you know, I, I think for anybody who's personally who's just thinking about making a move or doesn't feel like they're in the right place or they're not making the impact they want to have, it's like. You know, like the time is now, right? Like embrace that and just and figure out like what the what 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 does what does success look like and, and what does failure look like and is that really that bad? Sure. And and for a lot of times, I, I don't think it is. And I think having that's a rare dialogue, opinion in a banking city. Um, yeah. <laughs> failure is a very bad thing in a city like this at times. It, but, yeah, yeah, it is. But I guess it's the only way we know how to grow. It is. And it's the only way we we get put we push forward. And I think about. The biggest failures that we've had, me personally, me professionally, that was the time that we were really able to shed our skin and grow and move forward because we had to step back and reassess and we were pushed to make the uncomfortable move to learn and change. And I, I have so many examples of that like down the line where involuntary, you know, dis, you know, situations where we were like, oh, fuck, yeah. like this is a shit show. Like yeah. we are going to come out of this damaged and weakened and we didn't yep. because we just, we thrived from it and if 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 we could all like just you know recapture that and, and say to ourselves like you know failure is not you know if we learn so much and we grow so much from our failures why are we so scared to fail so it's almost more sins of omission than commission like it isn't mistakes that you made it's it's risks that you didn't take that could have led to growth opportunities absolutely like, and you'll yeah. never know and, yeah. yeah absolutely what to live with no, it, it's funny. Very early in my career, I, I looked at a couple of mentors that I had, and I was like, what's really different about them? And I was like, they just don't give a shit. <laughs> they, yeah. just, they go take risks, and they manage the risk, and they respond, they react to those, you know, to, to the yeah. curveballs that they get thrown, but they're, they're humans just like the rest of us. Yep. So. No, 100% agree. I like that. It's like it's all about managing risk. Yeah, I think that's exactly. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so what, what is the next big thing for Skipper? New cities, new offering, more of the same? What, what, what are your thoughts there? Um, yeah, so we, I mean, we're really exploring this opportunity with, with, with really changing the standard when it comes to pet care amenities and apartments. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, that's a blue ocean for us. Sure. We well, are, you can sell one building and get 150 dogs 
And, yeah. and what do you think your Locked conversion up. rate is in something like that? So we're, we're looking at somewhere between 20%. Wow. Um, and it depends on the apartment, right? It mm -hmm. depends on, on the, and that's what we're learning, right? We need more data points to mm -hmm. really be able to say for, you know, what, what, you know, what kind of conversion rate we'd expect depending on the community it is. But there, there's nothing for these pet parents who live in apartments. And they're already guilty enough because they live on the 20th floor mm -hmm. and they have this 50 pound dog and they're, and it's like, how, how do these apartments then go above and beyond and cater to them? And we have that answer. Yeah. And we are very excited to bring that to the world. And there's so much to be had there. So so we're, we're really pushing forward hard on that. Um, and, and is that more of a marketing effort for you then at this point or mar marketing and sales effort? It's just get out there and, mm -hmm. and get it's a biz dev effort. Yeah. yeah, it's about, you know, spreading the word. And we've got six facilities under construction that go live in the next six months. So we'll have an operational use case to look back on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I just I feel excited that we've been able to go under construction on on so many facilities opportunities without having really a precedence because I think the developers and, and, the, and the management recognize that this is the future. Sure. How they cater to their pet parents um, who live in, in, in these communities is, is going to decide for them like n their retention, their operating costs, the rental rates they charge, and it matters to them. Um, and, and so we, and, and we are stepping up to be that provider. So I think we are at a pivotal point where we need to, you know, really build a robust team that can go out and get those leads because I mean, there's, there's opportunity here and we're, we're able to fill it. Excellent. Excellent. Not to put you on the spot here, but what other local tech startup excites you the most and why? And it can be more than one. <laughs> um, and I, I know having been a founder myself, you only care about that. You can only care about your own. But if you step yeah. away from that and think oh, about yeah. the others that are out there. Well, so so I was really excited to hear the news about Map Anything. John mm -hmm. Stewart's been an advisor. We use Map Anything for our routing platform. And so we've worked very closely with them. Oh, they great. they they yeah, they gave us a special team to to help build out, you know, functionality and, and use cases that applied specifically to us. And so they've been super supportive and, and to hear their news. Um, and just to be close with John Stewart was was a really cool was really cool to see, and it is. It goes back to like you see that progress happening in the city that you live in, and you're like, yeah, how many John like? Stewarts are out there now who think, oh wow, I could be doing that exactly. right now? Yeah. Or yeah, and 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 what John Stewart and 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 everyone you know and and, and, and anything is going to be able to continue to do to to really push back and and build you know continue to help grow the 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 entrepreneurial scene here is 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 to be determined, but I feel like will be very great. And then from a from a peer standpoint, I have I've always been very close with um, the founders at Two Laundry, Dan mm -hmm. and Alex, and I very much I believe in people and and I believe in them mm -hmm. as founders, and they have crushed it. I mean, they have taken valet laundry to a whole new level and are really pioneering in a lot of ways that I look up to and and role model and respect. Um, yeah, I don't know them, but their their offering is is brilliant. The way that they've thought through it, and brilliant. that was when I heard about your offering and the way you thought about it. I remember thinking, wow, they really thought through it. And that, that was, to, to you, Laundry is the other one that I've heard of where I'm like, wow, they really thought through this process and how to improve it. Absolutely. Sure. Um, and yeah, and they're, and they're exploring channel partners kind of similar in, in the way that we are and, and the way that they've developed their cost centers to, you know, they've gone about like vertically integrating their supply chain in a way that's been, it's completely unprecedented. I mean, they're gonna consolidate the the, the, the laundry world and I'm just so excited for them because I've, I've known them you know from from early on and we have been a support system for each other so you know I feel very excited for what they're about to accomplish and yeah well those are two great two great examples thank you for that um, what is the best part about being part of a startup versus part of a successful big company now that you've been part of both well, if you're part of the right startup, then you can be a part of both. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess, so I guess that. Yeah. <laughs> I had not thought about that. You, why not be both? <laughs> what What's the worst part about the startup life? Um, uh, I guess you just... You it's just, not the bourbon on podcasts. Right. In full, 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 full working <laughs> spaces. Cheers to that. <laughs> no, that's definitely a perk. Um... <laughs> I guess you just have to be up for getting beaten down constantly, you know, and, and just and just you got to take it, and sure. you can't you can't be thin skinned. It's it's oftentimes not personal, and if it is, it's like you just move on. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. It's like you put yourself out there, and and that's okay. Like I, that we signed up for that. 
Um, sure. It's also lonely, I would say. I'd say the loneliness is the hardest part. Yeah. It feels like it all goes back on you, and it should, because yeah. you've taken that role, and that's the way it is. Um, and I think that's why community man- mat- matters so much, and mm-hmm. people who can empathize and, and who understand what you're going through and can help you problem solve. Um, I think that's why I've put so much stock over the last couple of years in really building out a, a group of people and a network mm-hmm. um, that I just, you know, are my people that yep. help me stay, you know, so alive and engaged and, and thriving. Very good. What is the last business book you read? So I just finished a great book called Building the Story Brand okay. by Donald Miller. And I liked it so much, I bought a copy for every single person on our leadership team, and we are tomorrow workshopping how we how we think about our client as the hero and the journey map that they go through, and okay. how we position ourselves as the guide to achieving their aspirational identity. It has totally redefined in my mind who we are and the value that we bring to our clients, and I can't wait for tomorrow to, to, to really workshop that with the, with, with the rest of the team who have now read the book um, and really roll that out. I, I think it's just a game changer in, in how you understand and um, articulate your value prop. So yeah, that was That's one. great. I, um, I have a friend who owns a company similar to, to Level, similar in concept, but they, um, he told me a story about a deal that they won where they were going up against an agency for some work that was a little more design oriented and they knew they were not going to win this work. They just really had no no shot at it. And they had hired a lady to run creative for them who came from an agency. And, and they, he said, look, we're really up against the wall here, but this will be a game changer for us. This will, this will double our revenue over the next year if we can win this deal. And what she did that was brilliant and, and along the same lines of what you're describing, um, she actually mocked up a copy of Wired Magazine and it had the CEO of their client on the front <laughs> And it had a headline that said, greatest decision ever was to give this work to XYZ Consultancy. And then that she wrote an article just laying out like the success and why it was successful and all the different metrics. And so rather than giving a proposal they gave here, let me help you visualize why this is the best possible outcome for Genius. you. Yeah, it was brilliant. That's and they won so the work. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and uh, like yeah, an example. yeah there's, exactly there's always things like that, though, where if you can build that story and build the yeah. your brand around that story, I can see why that's yeah. very powerful. So I'll put that in the, in the show notes for folks who want to cool. want to check that that book out. My next question was going to be a book you've gifted more than once, but you just answered that. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, so going back to the women in, in tech theme. I just got back from a week on vacation with my two lovely nieces. Um, one's three years old and one is nine months. And what can dads and uncles and moms do to get these young girls more excited about tech? And what are the mistakes that we make? And I think you, you touched on this a little bit, um, but that's more about the role models that are out there. Who can you know? You talked a lot about becoming role models for them. But what can the folks like? myself and my brothers who look at these little girls mm-hmm. and say, wow, we want them to experience the joy of what the rewards that we found out of our careers. How do we nudge them along that kind of path? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a great question. And I, you know, you say like, what gets them more excited? And mm-hmm. I think the assumption there is that they're not excited to begin with. And, it, and I think it's less to do, I think it's more to do about giving them the opportunities and the exposure to understand what they can be excited about. And, and being intentional around knowing what are the gaps between the opportunities currently given to boys versus girls, and then and then going in and helping to fill those gaps, and and you know making that a, a part of a, just just a part of like dinner conversation and w- w- kind of reworking what the what standards are like because sure. norms are so relative. But I think we so often just fall into these preconceived biases that we don't know we don't know we're doing it, and it's because of how we were raised, which is how our parents were raised. I have a great example of yeah. that. So I, I I used to work for a couple that owned a small business when I was seventeen, eighteen years old, and I had a friend who had the twins, a boy and a girl, and the mom bought presents for each of the for the boy and the girl, who are obviously the same age. And even she pointed out, she she believed in feminist concepts and was very progressive thinking, but she bought 
a Barbie doll for the girl and then an erector set for for the boy. And she's like, you know, I was thinking about this. Like, why did I do that? Like, what what message am I sending? And and, and you don't really think about it. And and maybe if she had given the erector set to the girl, the girl would have cried about it because she's already been programmed for, exactly. for a few years coming up to that. Yeah. So it, it is a tough question. And it's hard, and I get it, and it's there's no fault. I, th I think there's more fault in not rectifying it than there is in, in actually doing it in the first place. And I think mm -hmm. that's where that's where the obligation well of the onus is, yep. right? Like, recognize our failures here and help make them better. Yep. And and push us over the edge and, and give girls these opportunities to, to explore. Um, and, like, again, like what Project Scientist is doing, like, you know, traditionally underserved for, for women, for young girls, um, these opportunities in science and technology and engineering and math and like and and, and, if, and if they go other paths that's totally fine too sure. it's just this idea that we are limiting those opportunities from an uh, from a young age that sets us up to not take advantage of those things in the future which is why you have so so many male dominated fields i believe mm -hmm. and i think there's a lot of other things that go into to kind of what the the you know the um responsibilities of being a woman and, and having and, and having different choices than than what men have and, and that goes later on but I think having that strong foundation at least will help kind of guide that path and and help inform those decisions when you you know when we all have to make those tough calls absolutely so you talked a little bit before about what brought you to Charlotte what brought you back after after the Austin um, <laughs> Austin detour if you have had to leave Charlotte um, or if you just wanted to move on, what is your next best choice at this point? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. So as someone who, who has, has literally traveled around the world, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we it visited so many places and coming back from it, it was more of like, I think I, I more realized how many places in the world there are that I have yet, yet to visit. Um, but no place has ever felt like home like Charlotte has. And I think it's because I feel I, the exact same way. Yeah, way. yeah. I think it's the people. It's everything that's going on. It's the open-mindedness. Mm -hmm. I think that's why if you start any business that's good, you will succeed. Good yeah. enough, yeah. right? Like people are so open-minded to what you have to bring to them, and 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 you know you're you're starting to get you know new perspective from from people moving in, but you you have a good sense and and, and good group of 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 people who have are North Carolinians have been here for a while, even native. Charlotteans, and I know they're rare, but like just being a part of how dynamic the city is and, and how much is going on. And we are at such a precarious stage to be able to, to decide how, how close and connected and collaborative we are when this, when this scene becomes a lot bigger, mm -hmm. right? This is a very, like, this is a very special moment where, where we have, um, we have ability to influence that and, and, and make it easier for people coming up and show them the right way. And I go back to that because I think that's important in like everything that we do and, and the, the, the relationship that I have and, and how supportive they've been to, to what I'm building and what and, and how I hope to give back and am giving back. Um, it's just such a great place for that. I, you know, it's why we were headquartered here. It's why we'll continue, continue mm -hmm. to be headquartered here. I, that sounds only, like an answer to somebody who's maybe considering a career in politics. Yeah. After a big exit. <laughs> no, I do have an answer for this though because I, <laughs> I am I am a big fan at times of just like solitary, you know, just um, relaxation in in the mountains with a lake. So so if I had to pick, it would be it would be somewhere somewhere with a mountain and a lake. Okay, it would be my my go to. <laughs> That's excellent. So. I know, I know you've got a company to run, so I'll only ask you one more thing, and this one's really important. Um, what do you do for relaxation time? I mean, can you even unplug in the middle of everything that's going on right now? Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's important to unplug. I think it's important to, to, to be the best version of yourself at work. You have to be the best version of yourself at home too, and then mm -hmm. whatever that means for you. For me, that's, um, that's like togetherness with my friends. I really like being active and mm -hmm. outdoors. Um, just discovered Defy Gravity, which is a trampoline park. And my kids love it. Oh my it's... gosh, <laughs> had a blast! I will, like we, I, we have these really close friends that that have that have a really young daughter, and they invite me out to like when they go play at the like jungle gym because I just love like just like playing around. Like, it's a like, good outlet. It is sure. such a good outlet. Um, yeah, so just being active and being outside and being with friends um, is really how I unwind. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Maggie. I really appreciate you taking the time out of the day. I think that um, 
we had a really interesting discussion. I think that there's a lot that the listeners will take away from this, and I look forward to uh, working with you in the future. Yeah, well, thanks again. It was great.